Everybody, this is God's Church of Love online. This is more of a family talk, but for those of you on YouTube who may deal with the same thing, I pray that God opens your eyes, your heart, your mind, your soul to God's truth, to acknowledge it, to accept it, and to repent of whatever God shows you. What God showed me yesterday while I was sitting in my chair was a little child. And the little child was coming to class. The child comes to class. She brings an apple for the teacher. When she brings an apple for the teacher, she greets the teacher. She puts the apple on the desk. The teacher smiles and acknowledges. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. And the little girl is so happy because she's got the teacher's favor now. Now, as she sits, she watches. And now, what God is showing me, there are some of us in our group who are wounded beyond measure. We are wounded beyond our own estimation. And we don't realize how far that woundedness will take us and what damage it can do if we're not careful and totally in tune with what's really going on. Some of us feel like we do have a good handle on the Lord. We do. We have a relationship. We're connected. We're forgiven. But there's a story the Lord shared with me in the New Testament of a man who was following the disciples around. And when they had made sure that these, this group of people were filled with the Holy Ghost, this man who used to be a sorcerer had accepted Jesus, had gotten baptized in the name of Jesus, really had every intention of walking the walk as well as talking the talk. But he was so given to his past that he reverted back to some of his old ways and he asked, I think it was Peter or Paul, one of them, he asked one of the disciples um, how much would it cost for him to get that kind of power of the Holy Ghost. And the disciple said, your money perish with you. And the man was, oh, I'm sorry, pray that that doesn't happen to me. He didn't know. He was, he was given to his own resources. That's all he knew all his life was sorcery. So he was used to paying for power. Yeah, and that's what he, he, he liked seeing what the Holy Ghost was doing. He wanted some of that power. All right, so there are times what God was showing me yesterday there are people who are still children. We're grown. We've been on our own for years, but still children in a lot of ways, more ways than we realize. And we act as children. What do children do? Children manipulate. What do children do? Children seek attention. What do children do? Children tattletale. What do children do? Children rub up against mommy and daddy so they can be the favorite of all the brothers and sisters in the family. What do children do? A child will hug their daddy's leg in order to avoid a booty whooping. You know, let's say that I messed up Jeanette's shoes and they were in the closet. And I don't want to get in trouble because I shouldn't have been messing with her stuff in the first place. So I'm like, oh, daddy, daddy, look what Paul did. Paul was over there doing so and so. And we try to shift the focus to the other person to another person 
to another thing, to something went wrong, to the accident across the street, to some major catastrophe that happened down the street where the cops are trying to shift the focus so that nobody notices what we did or what we are getting wrong. See, what God is showing me is that all comes from neediness. Some of the boldest people you know out there are the most needy. The most needy. And the sad part is only part of that is acknowledged or recognized. But the deepest part is not seen at all. The worst kind of boss you can work for is a boss who is very insecure. I knew a friend. I'm really trying to lay the groundwork so you know where I'm coming from. I knew a friend who had a boss. The friend was extremely intelligent. She was a seven-day Adventist. She was extremely intelligent. She was one of my hair customers. And we would have the deepest conversations. And she always, we always used to have to pray that God would work out the situation with the boss, which God finally did. He just kind of removed her. <laughs> yeah. Because the woman would need her to do a lot of her typing and correction. The woman couldn't write. She couldn't rub two sentences together without making all kind of grammatical and spelling errors. But she was dull on top of this woman. She was on her like white on rice. She was constantly on a case, constantly badgering her, constantly correcting her, constantly criticizing her, constantly making her look like an idiot in front of everyone. She would do whatever she could to demean this woman. And she would lord over her and boss her and be dominant over her. And I told you, like she was scolding a little kid. And she had to do everything she could to stay at that job without just saying, forget it. I've had, I'm done with this idiot. God kept her there and got rid of the idiot. Now, what I want to share with you is what we saw when we would read her writings. We would say, my goodness, no wonder she hated you. No wonder she made life hard on you. She was jealous of what you had. What you have is everything she needs to do her job. You could take her job and run with it, even though you don't want it. But she knows it, and it threatens her. So rather than be threatened and have anybody else shine her, she makes you look like a little pea in order for her to look like a giant. Why? Why does she do that? Not because she's a wench. Not because she's mean. Not because she's evil. But because she's broken, bruised, battered, and wounded. And she does not know how to handle her emotional insecurities. Her emotional scars. Her smallness. See? Anytime somebody's got to constantly remind you of what they did good, what they said good, how well they did, they need strokes. That's a neediness. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not trying to get rid of trash. None of us in this group are trash. We are all God's children. We are all God's creation. And we all need God's healing and deliverance. And we need to recognize it because hurting people hurt people. Now, before I get to talking too much, thank you, Lord. I'm going to read God's word. Ooh, I'm telling y'all, you did this is going to cut deep. I'm, I'm just getting you ready. It's not me trying to get anybody or point the finger. None of that. Please understand. Whew. Okay. Got to read pretty much the whole chapter almost. 
Jude chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of these things which they know not. But when they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. These are spots in your feast of charity. Charity is love. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are, without water, carried about of winds, Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Let me explain this right now. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds, they are without water. What is a cloud? You, ex you see a cloud, you expect to see rain. These clouds are non-productive. That's what that's saying. Non-productive. Let's break that down. Whew. Some people think they have and God is saying, no, you don't. You don't have what you think you have. Some of you are as empty as tin cans. And you think you're full of the Lord, but you're not. You think you're full of love, but you're not. <sighs> All right, clouds without water. We dealt with that. Carried about of winds. What does that mean? One minute you're whipping over here. The next minute you're whipping over there. Fickle, 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 fickle. You don't know where you're really coming from, but you think you do. Mm -hmm. Trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit. What did Jesus do when he saw the fig tree that didn't bear any fruit when he was hungry? He cursed it. Jesus, the loving Savior, the baby in the manger, he cursed the tree that bore not fruit. Be careful what fruit you bear, y'all. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. 
And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers complainers, walking after their own lust. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Look at me. You admire me? Ain't I wonderful? Yes, I'm all that and a bag of chips. I'm one of God's favorites. Yes, I am. It's great swelling words. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last days. Let me say that again. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last days who should walk after their own ungodly flesh. See, we don't always know when we're walking after our own ungodly flesh. The Holy Ghost has to show us if we're willing to not only see, acknowledge, confess, but change, turn from it. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. Do you know what it said about Separating themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, causing division. Some of you have no idea that what you're doing is causing divisions. What did God say in Corinthians? There should be no schisms in the church. Since you know there should be no schisms, then whatever you're doing to cause division needs to stop. And some of you don't realize what you're doing is causing division. Your heart's in the right place, I hope. Since I'm not God, I don't know. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. That's causing divisions. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Christ unto eternal life. Of Jesus Christ, listen. This is where some of us fall short. Some of us don't really know that we really don't know what love really is. We want it. We like it. We want to give it. We like the warm and fuzzies that go with it. We like the goodness that accompanies it. But some of us really don't know what love really is. And agape love is a much higher level of love than some of us have ever been able to express like we think we have. One of the prayers I used to pray years ago was, Lord, I don't know what love is. I need you to show me. See, some of us don't know that we don't know what love is. That, that is a big issue right there. If we don't even know that we don't know what love is, then we're going to get it wrong every time, trying to get it right. All right, let me stop there and move on. Mm. Verse 22, And of some have compassion making a difference. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Okay, we're going to move on to the next, ver the next chapter. 
And then we're going to see what else the Lord says. Chapter 3, Titus chapter 3. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceiving, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of our God, our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, mm -hmm. but according to the mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. All right, I'm going to stop there. Listen, what God is showing me, and I want to say this publicly to every one of you, and I've got to say it the way the Lord had me, the way he registered it in my spirit. I spent half the day yesterday removing the spirit of wrath off of me. Yes, I did. I had to get prayer and counsel. Now, this is what I want to ask every single one of you. From now on, if God shows you anything about any member in our congregation, trust God enough to tell me himself. And you pray. You do spiritual warfare. But don't tell me. And the reason I ask you not to tell me is because it puts me in bondage. And I don't want anything to consume me in an unnatural way. I had to rebuke the devil and get all kind of prayer to get that off of me. I opened my front door and commanded that crap to leave my house. And as soon as I did that, I was fine. But the Lord showed me it's not always godly to do that. It's not always God leading to make people aware of every little thing going on. Some people are better not knowing, and God handles it. Some people are better only hearing it from God. Because what it ends up doing is it causes division. It causes suspicion. You start looking at people out the corner of your eye. And you start wondering and, and, and asking and seeking and peeking. And that's not what God wants. He wants prayer. Prayer. He wants spiritual warfare. There are some of us in this group that are not going to get along with everybody. And some of us that are not going to be crazy about everybody. But I'm going to tell you right now. There are no favorites in this group. There will never be any favorites in this group. No big eyes, no little U's. Help me, Lord, help me. This is all in love. Understand, God does not want schisms in the church. And I'm taking authority over every spirit that casts suspicion on others. I take authority over every spirit that brings slander on any others. I take authority over every spirit that wishes harm to any other. In the name of Jesus, 
There are times we as born again Christians, we know it's a sin to gossip. So we find a way around it and we stir the pot, stir the pot, stir the pot. And we say, we think in our heart, this I'm acting under the unction of God. God does not stir the pot like that. When God wants to say something, he addresses it straight out. So what I say is if God shows you, see, there are times God showed me a lot of things, a lot of things. And I was not to share it with anybody. I was to pray it down. Destroy it, cast it out, drive it out permanently, not to discuss it with anyone. What we don't realize is when we do that, we are literally using another form, a camouflage form of gossip. When we are insecure, when we have emotional scars, when others have cast shadows of doubt cast on them and then they look suspicious. It's like the little student that brings the apple to the teacher. They want to be the teacher's pet. They want to be the teacher's favorite. And they'll go up to the teacher and whizzy in her ear. I saw so-and-so pick on so-and-so. So-and-so took so-and-so's book. And we think we're adults, but we don't realize God showed me. We are acting as children. That's why sometimes your strongest gifting can be your biggest undoing and you don't see it. Because anytime you mix a gift of God, a holy, divine gift of God with the flesh, it is tainted, it is cursed, and it does more harm than it does good. Please understand, we have to love so much that we cover a multitude of sin. We're not hiding sin. We're not winking at sin. Oh, yeah, I see what you're doing, but that's all right. Yeah, I got you on the down low. No, it ain't about that. It's you communicate with God on behalf of your brother. Lord, I ask you, show me, Lord, how to pray for this person because I don't like what I see. And you pray with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if God, God has to, you have to know that you know that you know that God has directed you. And the best way to know it, the best way is ask God, like he does often. He confirms things between two and three witnesses. Yes, he does. He works that way a lot of times. And there are times when I'm not sure, or if I think I see what I think I see, I ask God to confirm it between two and three witnesses. Whether it's a witness of circumstance, whether it's whatever witness, God knows how to confirm. He knows how to fleece it for you. He'll give you signs. So what you do is you zip the lip. You fight the urge to bring it to the light. And you ask God to do the exposing. You ask God to confirm it. But in two or three ways. From two or three sources. So that it's beyond the shadow of a doubt. Before you open your mouth wide. What that does, it can cause contention, suspicion, 
hatred, resentment. I remember, for example, years ago, let's go back to my childhood, because we're talking about childishness. When I was a child, and uh, I accidentally hit a young lady that was my size, my age, she and I were the biggest ones in the in the class, we was big as the teacher, tall and wide and developed. And I hit her poor little boobies by mistake. I talked with my hands and it went well and I bam! And it hit her and I know it was tender because mine were tender. We were in the development stage, fourth grade of all things. She hauled off, knee jerk response, she slapped me. Well, I knew that she wasn't angry with me. I knew that that was a response to what I did to her. Now, what the kids did, the children around us told her, Pat did that on purpose. I saw that. I saw she did that on purpose. Y'all need to handle it after school. Stir in the pot. Y'all need to handle that. You need to handle it. Handle it. Take it outside. Deal with it. Because I saw it. That was on purpose. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm trying to tell you, if you look for problems hard enough, you'll find them. You'll find them. If I look at Lynn long enough, I'll find something wrong. If I'm looking for something wrong, if I look at, at my baby sis Renee long enough, I'll find something wrong if I look hard enough, if I'm suspicious, if I look at uh, at Anthony long enough, I'll find something wrong. You know why? Something's wrong with all of us. Every single one of us, while I'm look, how the, how's that old song used to go in the streets, uh, the secular song, I was looking at you. You were looking at me. Uh, so we have to think. There's a West Indian song, while while you, yeah, while you look in that monkey. Uh, it's, uh, I forget the guy's name, not West Indian, uh, Bill Withers, I think. While you look in that monkey, monkey looking dead at you. So the very thing you think you got over someone else, they probably got some stuff on you you're not even aware of. See? <laughs> As they say, when you point the finger, you got three more pointing back at you. Be very, very careful. Be very careful. Because what the Bible says is he who exposes his own sin is covered by God. You hear what I'm saying? Be careful about wanting to expose other people's sin. When they talked about the gainsaying of Corey, what did Corey do to Moses? Yeah, all them guys got together. You think you're the only one can hear from God? Yeah, look, Jack, you ain't the only one can hear from God. You know, we can hear from him too. So what happens? Moses didn't bring, he, he was like the angel. He didn't bring a railing accusation and say, don't you dare, don't you know who I am? No. He said, I'll tell you how we handle this. We take it outside and let God say who's who. And Moses went to God. He didn't go whizzy, 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 you know. He went to God. That's what he did. And God drew the line in the sand. And he handled it. He ended the conversation. See, be very careful. Because Satan can use you as an agent. What does the Bible say about the devil? The devil is an accuser of the brethren. That thing weighed so heavy on me, I'm telling you. We all have to be very careful of it. Some of us are not crazy about some of the other folks. I've heard a number of you say little things about the members in our group. 
See, church people are guilty of doing this. And I'm just about up to here with it. I don't want to hear anybody come to me when God can show me. When my first husband committed adultery, my sister didn't have to come and tell me. My niece, I'm, I'm getting street now for a reason. My niece didn't have to come tell me, Jack, baby. Why? Because when I was in the bed minding my own business, God gave me a dream and showed me that man in a bed with another woman. The second month after our marriage and three days later, here comes the confirmation. My ex-husband comes home. I never asked him about it. I never confronted him about it. God worked him so upset he couldn't handle the sin himself. And he came home and confessed that he had committed adultery. Without me lifting a finger, without me poking out a lip, without an ounce of attitude, nobody had to come burn my ear. Girl, did you hear? No. I know some of y'all ain't crazy about each other, but I command you in the name of Jesus, love one another. And if you can't love one another, get the heck out of Dodge. Because ain't no favorites going to be in God's church of love. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. You that insecure, you better stay in God's face till you get home. You may not be ready to be part of a body of Christ yet. You better get that healing before you end up tearing down what God has built up. And I rebuke every one of you who have issues with any one of you. Do not let those issues turn into a camouflage work of God and you start tearing down, tearing down, tearing down. No, 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 no. I'm not having it. I'm not having it. Don't bring me no apples. Don't bring me no flowers. Don't send me no money. Don't bring me no honey. Don't do any favors for me. The reason I say that is because I know from what God showed me yesterday, it's the little child bringing the teacher an apple. Why does the child bring the teacher an apple? The child wants to be, the child needs to be somebody's favorite. The child didn't get the love they needed. The child didn't get the strokes they needed. The child didn't get the hugs they needed. The child didn't get the reassurance they needed. The child didn't get the encouragement they needed. They need it. They're needy, needy, needy. They're hurting. They're empty. They're clouds without rain. <laughs> Trees without fruit. Twice dead, plucked up by the root. There's a problem deep down inside. Do not spread or use your problem to tear down. Because I'm going to tell you right now. The gates of hell will never prevail against the kingdom of God. And God's church of love is part of God's kingdom. It will not be torn down on my watch. I love everyone in this group. Every single one. In spite of all of our issues, in spite of all of our imperfections, in spite of my own. I love me in spite of me. Why can't I love you in spite of you? I'm going to share this with you because I've seen some of this in our group. I'm going to use my mother as an example. My mother's with the Lord now. The Lord showed me she made it at the very last hour. She made it. Squeak! Now, my mother, if I come in the house and I take my hat off and lay it on the bed because I have no superstitions whatsoever. My mother, who was the queen of superstition, 
Patty, get that hat off the bed. You know, that's bad luck. And I'm sitting up here rolling my eyes. I wouldn't let her see it. Cause I wasn't rolling my eyes at her. I was rolling my eyes at the silliness. Wherever you lay your hat, you just lay your hat. But she was suspicious. All right. What was the other thing? She would, don't walk under that ladder. When you live with people who are loaded with suspicions, I mean superstitions, those same people who grew up in that atmosphere tend to be very suspicious of everyone. Of everyone. If I call Renette and her phone dies on me and she doesn't call me back, uh-huh, yeah, here's the suspicion. Yeah, I know she just want to get me off the phone. No, Renee has enough sense and enough know-how to say, girl, I'm tired of talking to you. Get off the phone. I got something to do. <laughs> we can tell each other that without being offended. Because we're not looking for snakes under every rock. What you mean by that? What you mean by that, Willis? What you trying to say, Willis? No. Everything doesn't have an underhanded motive behind it. And the more insecure, the more fearful, and the more suspicious you are, and superstitious, the more you're going to see. You're going to see stuff. Oh, you're going to see. Oh, it's, it's like uh, that little demon that I played when I was trying to show how the demon tries to cast suspicion. And I was like, oh, yeah, I saw what they were trying to say about you. Oh, I heard that. Did you hear that? Ooh, I wouldn't take that. Ooh. Yeah, that's the I'm telling you that's the way some of us are. Church, I mean, God's church, God's people, filled with the Holy Ghost, that with a mighty burning fire, but also the Holy Ghost battling for space because we also got too much flesh up in there too. One minute you speak of the Lord, the next minute you're an agent of the devil. What did Peter do? You are Christ. Yes, son of the living God. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, only the Holy Spirit can reveal that to you. Flesh and blood didn't show you that. The very next thing, oh no, oh no, 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 you will never get crucified. Oh no, 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 God forbid, no, we can't have that. What did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. And some of y'all don't know. One minute you're unctioned of the Lord, and the next minute Satan's got you blah, 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 blah. Just like a, a dummy sitting on a ventriloquist lap. And what will Satan do? Well, God's trying to use you to edify the kingdom that you love, that you like, that you enjoy being a part of, that you value. Satan will be right around the corner waiting to use your very next words to tear it down and tear people down with it. See, there, there are times, there are times when some things are left, the better left unsaid. It's not winking at sin. It's not hiding sin, but it's love. Some things are better prayed than said. Okay, so ask God to give you the discipline, the discernment to know the difference. Please. I remember when I was young, I used to love gossip. My niece Peggy and I would get on the phone. Girl, did you hear? Girl, oh, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. And guess what else? And we'd be quack-quacking and laughing and getting off on it, having the ball. Stirring up somebody else's dirt. Getting off on it. When God showed me he didn't like it, I had to learn to keep my mouth shut when I wanted to get up and blast it on the front page. That was a battle for me. That was a major battle for me to keep my mouth, my big mouth shut. That was one of those areas of self-control where I was incontinent 
and I needed God to give me all the help to shut my mouth. So when I got around the saints and I had issues with the saints, I didn't go tell this one or go tell, did you notice how the, yeah, did, 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 no, no. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love prays and intercedes for them. Pray for your enemy. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Don't talk about them. See, some of us, we think we're, we're of the Holy Ghost when we say, uh, Lynn, I want you to, to pray with me. We need to pray about so-and-so. Now, some of us just need a little counsel because we're having a hard time dealing with somebody. We're not putting them down. We're having a hard time dealing with them. No problem with that. But to sit there and just go on and on. And did you see this? And do you notice that? Do you, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I heard that. Did you? Yeah, you checked that? Yeah. No. That's gossip. That's slander. Oh, God, help us not to tear down what you're trying so hard to build up in love. We can all heal together if we stop spying on each other. We are not God's spies. He told us to spy out the land, not each other. Think about that. If God wants us to peep something, he'll show it to us like he did me with my ex-husband in the bed with another woman. And I never addressed it. I prayed about it and left it alone, left it right there with God. And God moved on my ex-husband to come and confess what he had done. Nobody in my family knew. My pastors knew, but nobody in my family knew what was going on. When I divorced Kirk, everybody was in shock because except the few guys that saw him with prostitutes, they knew what was up. But I never told it. And I didn't have to tell the pastors about his adultery because he told them and asked for prayer. Everything ain't on us to make it happen. No, we're not to make it happen. God doesn't need our help, y'all. God knows how to address an issue. Joshua knew nothing about Achan hiding the sinful stuff under his camp. But God knew. And God called that thing on the carpet. Told Joshua who to call, what to say, what to do. Joshua didn't know what the heck. He was like, Lord, why are we losing? He said, get up off your face. Israel has sinned. See, I don't want God telling me, you have sinned one time too many. There's too much to deal with you. I don't want God looking at me with that parental scold in the eye. I don't want to, I don't want to feel that anger coming from him to me. Like, God, take me. Don't let me stay here and mess things up. Don't let me ruin anybody's life. Don't let me discourage. Even the Bible says for parents not to show their anger at a child to the point where they discourage the child. We have to be very careful how we handle one another. All right, I'm done. I'm going to shut up, Lord. That's what I feel like you're saying. You've said all need to be said. Love one another. Forgive one another. Be obedient to the Holy Ghost. And learn self-control. God bless you. And I'm done.